I don't care to land, right? but I yeah. do really care to explore. At some point, I just felt like essentially the way everyone's practicing spirituality is as if the purpose of being here is a fact finding mission. Like those self hiding things, the purpose is to nail them down, get them right. And when you right. die, you're going to be given a Scantron. And if you get the right answers, you yeah, get yeah, to yeah. go into the good place. Right, right, right. And I think when I would try to pray or meditate or connect with whatever the, the goodness of the universe is, I just never felt that that thing was would ever give me a Scantron. Welcome back to the transmission, my friends. So lovely to be with you. One of the things that absolutely kills me about modern philosophically dipped curiosity facing discourses is how mirthless they are, how absolutely flavorless and soulless they tend to be. And sometimes that's by necessity, right? Sometimes you just need to do that rote memorization, just grind your way through a bunch of facts. But it need not be that way when we're exploring the wondrous and the meaningful, even if we're doing it rigorously. Hell, even if it's the opposite and we're talking about the tragic, there's often still an opportunity to tickle the mystery in there. And that in general is the overarching spirit of this mind meld with Andy J. Pizza. Is that his real name? Yes, he is the heir to the pizza fortune. Of course, I jest that is not Andy's real name, but he is the best-selling author of Invisible Things. He is an illustrator. He's also got a lovely podcast called Creative Pep Talk and student and enthusiast of all things Jungian. He is a fellow wielder of the sort of mythopoetic lens that we tend to gravitate toward in this media vessel, there is a considerable girth of mirth wrapping around the whole enterprise that is this episode. So much good stuff in this one. Many Jungian musings, the relationship between the collective unconscious and creativity, active imagination and illustration, the labyrinth that is modern meaning-making in general, many ancient Greek platonic hermetic leaning riffs and oodles. More, all the links you will need for Sir Andy J Pizza are in the description. Same for third eye drops. On the note of this media vessel, do now presently tickle that algorithm with a like, a sub, a comment, a share. It is all immensely important for us. And did you know that third eye drops is a long running audio only podcast? as well. That is where we got our start. So by virtue of that, we've got over 300 audio only episodes that you will only be able to hear on podcast platforms. So do subscribe on Apple Pods, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you want to go a layer deeper, initiate yourself into our Patreon Wonder Lodge at patreon.com forward slash third eye drops where we do monthly Zoom hangs, a book club, a patron-only Discord server. You can get rewards like stickers, pins, shirts, and more at patreon.com forward slash third eye drops. And with that, my fellow sentient sacks of Stardust, let's meld minds with my new wonder brother and yours, Andy J. Pizza. Yeah, I was really interested when I saw the sort of combination of playfulness, did I put a T in there somewhere? Playfulness, <laughs> play, um, yeah. Um, that combined with your interest in Jung has really piqued my interest, and I'm curious how that came into your method, into your curiosity, and into all the way on up to to wanting to talk to me. I'm curious yeah. how all these how all these things coalesced. <laughs> well, hey, man, I'm super pumped to be here. Uh, like I said, before we got on, I just kind of, I've been, you know, I'm an illustrator. I talk to a lot of different artists and creators on my podcast, but I haven't really properly made the leap into worlds around psychology, philosophy, spirituality in any significant way 
other than personally. So I don't, I haven't really dove into those worlds via podcast conversations or in real life or whatever. And, um, and yeah, it's, a huge part of my creative practice and kind of always has been. And so, you know, I've checked out your podcast uh, a bunch of times. I love your kind of dives into archetypes and young and some of the conversations you have. Um, I loved your episode with uh, Lisa Miller, Dr. Lisa Miller. That was phenomenal. And I've been listening to one of your recent ones with uh, Eric and. uh, Oh yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I just, you know, I'm just kind of pumped to talk about it from that angle because it's weird. I I I kind of got into young via Joseph Campbell and I that journey has that hero's journey into the hero's journey has right. been happening for probably a decade plus or something. I got really obsessed with story, story structure, myth. I really honestly I this sounds kind of like a joke but I I'm genuine when I say story is kind of how I think of my religion. Like I just yeah. think that's kind of my guiding practice. And, uh, and I, at the further I got into Jungian, you know, philosophy and, and all the analysts and all that dream theories and, and interpretation, the more shocked I've been, Mm -hmm. that it's not a bigger thing in the visual art world or in especially in illustration, like illustration more than any other practice is writing with pictures, which is kind of the definition of a symbol. And so I just feel like I've been, I, I, over the past few years, especially stumbled into this like treasure trove. Uh, and then reverse engineering like oh there's a bunch of ways that this has been working itself through my work since i got started as a creator so all that to say i'm pumped to finally talk to someone um who has a maybe even a deeper understanding of this stuff um and come at it from two different ways we'll see man we'll see it's a weird it's a weird little pod of thinkers that's you know, it's it's weird because I'm not True. I'm not traditionally trained in any of this stuff. I, like you, have just been an enthusiast and it has made things make so much more sense. And when you confront the titanic nature of Jung's intelligence and just how much he read, you know, I, I was just recording an intro earlier and I made the remark of I just love when I stumble across these people who have that really deep technical empirical knowledge and mm. they still refuse to orphan the subjective visionary phenomenological type of wisdom too because they realize they're you know they're they're two parts of of the the non-dual coin you know they're they're both parts of what Jung would call the the unus mundus or whatever. Yeah. And you really need to look at life and wisdom and sense making from both angles. Um, and it's rare to find that. And Jung, I think, was probably the premier thinker in that kind of dual, dual, non-dual way of like yeah. the 20th century, for for me at least, or or very high up there. You know, obviously people like Campbell are up there too. Um yeah. But I'm I'm with you, man. And just also with that desire to go back into the corpus of ancient wisdom and realize there's so much in there that we need. You know, there mm. there are like we can't we can't abandon abandon the ancient Hellenistic and Greek lineages of wisdom. We can't um, abandon native sources of wisdom. We can't abandon Eastern wisdom. They all have something core to say. Even now, to an illustrator like you and some, you know, dude sitting in his, you know, bedroom, uh, office, um, you know, almost a hundred, like depending on what we're talking about, hundreds or thousands of years later. And yeah. so wh- why, why do you think that is like, what, what is it to, uh, that speaks to you about it? Uh, you know, <clears throat> a couple of things you said in there that I wanted to just pull out. One was his thinking being so, vast that 
whenever you find someone who's kind of enamored with this thought, whether they're, you know, trained in it or just stumbled into it mm -hmm. and became obsessed. I love how, cause I don't feel I'm not someone who's threatened by other people's point of view. I'm just curious about it for the most part. And, uh, that what you realize is if someone's into Jungian thought, that can mean so many different things, right. but I loved how you, I think what you were saying or how I understood it was I'm so attracted to this school of thought because it manages to be metaphysical and physical at the same right. time without right. Without, yes, like he definitely had his years that were more out there than others. And, and, but it all seemed to never, you know, he never, I feel like when you dive into spiritual thought or philosophical thought or however you want to slice it, you, you get a lot of people that end up mm -hmm. wanting to pretend like, we don't live in reality and you right. know, want to adopt a lot of ideas and I'm open. Like I like, and I like fun ideas too. I don't even have to believe them to yeah. have some fun with them. Like that's, I, I like that, but I love, I think what resonates with me and why it's kind of risen to the top out of all the different things that I've explored uh, as a human and as an artist is that it manages to have the essence of something that feels truly like transcendent and spiritual, mm -hmm. you know, when you, when you really hear uh, a great interpretation of a dream or a myth or a story, you get a feeling that is not unlike yeah. what you get at a, you know, the most ideal transcendent experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and yet there's no piece of you in that moment that's having to break off what you know to be true about just basic fundamental reality. Right, it's, right. You're able to hold both at the same time and it does that better than anything else. And then, you know, personally for my illustration practice, I went on a really, uh, a classical kind of hero's journey where 10 years ago I was an illustrator, uh, working as a commercial illustrator with brands and that kind of thing, magazines and all that. And I really fell in love with story and I fell in love with public speaking and podcasting and all that kind of thing. And I really dove deep into it. And I had a season where I was still working as an illustrator, but I kind of had lost interest in, or, or the passion wasn't there. It was more just mm -hmm. becoming like a skill. Yeah. And then by the time I had my real deep dive into Jungian thought, it's kind of always been at the periphery. I've known, uh, I've always liked Jungian stuff, but I, it wasn't in the past until the past, maybe two or three years that I really started to dive deeper into it. Um, but when I did and I stumbled into symbol and archetype and dream interpretation, all that kind of thing, I realized that the image and the symbol and the picture is where the power of a story comes to life. Yeah. And it wasn't until I, and I don't mean, you know, that I'm not saying that in a way that's like fanciful. I think it's very practical that when you have the right image to illustrate a point or a, a, a proof in a story, the point, the theme, the, the emotion and the power comes from that symbol. And I'll right. give you one really quick example because Please, otherwise yeah. it's just really abstract. Um, one of my favorite story experts is a guy named Brian McDonald. He wrote a book called Invisible Ink. And um, in that book, he talks, he talks through a lot of different stories that he's a big fan of. But one of the stories he dissects is Iron Giant, which is like a, you know, a classic mm -hmm. movie and a really phenomenal story. And the moment where it clicked for me was I kind of took what he said and I pushed it a little into the Jungian world and it had this profound effect on me. So he talked about how the point of that movie is you are who you choose to be. And, and the reason why they choose this robot as the symbol 
is a robot is the direct opposite of that. And right. so it it's the thing that is engineered to be a particular thing. And in that movie, if it's engineered to be a, a war machine and then it chooses to be something that saves humanity, that's an illustration of you are who you choose to be. But then as I was listening to Jungian uh, analysts interpret dreams over a long time. And, and I dove into the, the work. I found that when you found the language that works for both the illustration and the point you're trying to make, when you really line that up, it has, at least to me, this kind of chemical aha moment. It just has this feeling. And so he said, you are who you choose to be. And I thought if you're trying to make it as an interpreter would take it, I think they would say, defy your programming. Mm. And it's that idea of defying your programming brings that symbol to light. And all of a sudden, the fact that you chose an illustration of a robot to talk about pro human programming yeah. and our own DNA and all that, the symbol, the metaphor, the picture has all of this power. Yeah. And then I came all the way home and just fell in love with illustration. So sorry, yeah. sorry for such no. a giant explanation, I, but I, that's kind of no, what happened. I, I'm really glad you bring this up because you're evoking one of the richest archetypes that is mercurial and takes on so many forms and never leaves the zeitgeist. And that is, you know, what we could call the sort of Plato's cave allegory, the Gnostic matrix myth, you know, essentially mm -hmm. this idea of fatalism versus free will, right? Or determinism yeah. versus free will. But where it gets so, where, where you get into such a fractal mind fuck is that both fatalism and free will are required to make some kind of cosmic order happen in a way that almost sounds paradoxical, but I think mm. works in a compatibilist kind of way. And, and here's what I mean by that. So you may have heard me ramble or you may have heard of the book Souls Code, right? Yeah. Um, which is a book by James Hillman, post-Jungian thinker, very famous in his own right. And this book sold really well. And Essentially, if, if I give you a very shallow boilerplate summary of this book, it would almost sound like I'm contradicting what you're saying, mm. where there's a very heavy fate component to this book in saying that you come into this world with a unique pattern and only you can live out this pattern and only you yeah. can explore this pattern. And that you could think of as Jungian individuation, right? Like becoming the person only you can become with all of your eccentricities and and unique flair that that's the point of your incarnation if you will is to become that unique thing which yeah. in a way is fate but i think that also requires us to go against the grain in the kind of society we live in because this society doesn't reward you for living out your own unique fate like this society doesn't reward you for individuating individuating it rewards you for fitting into a box right mm -hmm. and I, i'm sure you know we're of a similar age so we grew up taking these career tests in school and you know having the like the the soul eroding conversation of what do you want to be when you grow up and and <laughs> yeah. career aptitude tests and stuff and man did my did my soul wriggle against that kind of stuff from a mm. young age um it's funny i'm so programmed to say jung because i've been berated <laughs> in the comments for saying young that yeah, i almost yeah. just said jung instead of young when i actually <laughs> meant the word young there but yeah. um but yeah so so there's this weird like combat compatibilistic thing and then you know, that gets into all the ancient Greek lore about what fate is. And I could I could go there, but I don't want to hijack the conversation in that direction yet. Um, so how do, how do you feel about that? Are, are, you, are you OK with taking this compatibilistic view of it? Or does is, is there something that really in you that wants to maintain that that grip on true free will? 
Uh, no, I don't. I, um, for, first of all, I, I, it's a great question. It's a question I've thought about quite a bit and I'm going to answer it, but I just want to quickly say that the iron giant point, I don't actually, what, what blows me away about that isn't the point they're making. It's more just how the illustration mm. brings that point to life. Yeah. Um, and why choosing the robot to illustrate it is such a power. It just kind of highlights the power of a symbol. But I personally, in terms of you are who you choose to be, no, I don't really feel like that. I, I think I kind of, it, I, I went down, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you probably did a similar thing at some point, you know, running around on the internet with ideas. You're going to get into that place where you're going to find those um, determinists and you're going to get deep into existential dread of the very, very little ability that we have to choose anything. Yeah. Um, I went down that, uh, actually Lisa Miller was one of the people that helped me out of that a little mm, bit. Mm. Um, yeah, and, she's, uh, what a, what a, what a me just medicine and human form she is. 100%. And I, uh, I needed that and I, but yeah, I think it's some, I, I kind of always just feel like, uh, improv and, um, one of my great, I'll, I'll talk as a creator since that's what I can speak to. One of my true Norths is the way that they creatively make Curb Your Enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. I feel like, I don't know if you're familiar with like, Oh yeah. I love, I, yeah. Well, I, yeah. I love Curb. Yeah. Uh, and do you know, like, have you heard before that they have like an outline of the plot but they don't have a script. So oh, they okay. know, they know where it's going. They know mm -hmm. like, these are the, the three acts that we have to get in. These are like the plot points, Yeah. but they don't, when they start a scene, they know like by the end of the scene, Cheryl has to be mad at Larry for this thing, but they don't script it. And I think to me, that's kind of the perfect balance of plotter versus pantser improv versus, you know, yeah. outline. Mm -hmm. And I kind of relate that, that's, I think that's kind of how I've conceptualized, um, our relationship to fate or God yeah. or whatever is, you know, I can't imagine a good reason to create a somewhat conscious being with some kind of agency yeah. without the point being letting them have some authorship, right, you know, like, right. and so to me, I think it's, there's a collaborative yes and kind of thing between right. life, your code, what you're, and then what kind of happens. Cause I, I also am really struck by how, uh, you know, I, I kind of feel like the deep self can't fully see the world as it is. It's almost like I've, I've thought a lot about as I've navigated, you know, my podcast a lot about creative practice. It used to be even more about creative career kind of navigating. And I just kind of wanted to creative practice leans towards the creative side rather than the career side. Um, but uh, one of the things I've really embraced is this idea that in the same way that a, a nighttime dream is kind of nonsense unless you interpret it a daydream is nonsense unless you interpret it. It's that same, yeah. like you have this deep self impulse when you're yeah. a kid to be like, I've thought about it like this. Like if you dream, oh, I want to be an astronaut. Like, yeah, that might be true, but, or it could be that that was an archetype or a symbol of escaping your toxic atmosphere that you yeah, felt right, like you were right, in, right. Or shooting mm -hmm, for the stars mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever. Um, so that's kind of, I don't know if that answers that question, but that's kind of how I think of the, fate versus choice thing, especially totally. in navigating your path. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, even if you don't believe in anything metaphysically, we're, we're not, we're clearly not this open-ended being completely. I mean, you, you inherit genetics, epigenetics, blah, 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 you know, where yeah. you're born, what your income level of your parents was, all this stuff, all of it bears enormously on what you're capable of. And then to your point, you can get down the super 
reduction reductionist materialist rabbit hole of you have no free will you're literally just the result of atoms colliding and physical laws and everything in your brain is predetermined and you're the victim of all you know all of these things essentially just a big domino set, right essentially is that line of thought in it yeah and and i just don't get down with that because yeah even if, even if you could predict my actions 99 times out of 100 that some people would say right there, look, we've proven you don't have free will, but I yeah. still have that one choice. You know, I still have that one choice and that could be a significant choice because what if that choice leads to meeting a person? What if that choice leads to moving? What if that choice leads to having an idea you wouldn't, you, you, I just don't buy that you can contain it in these, in these physical boundaries like that. I think that yeah. it's too stochastic. It's, and, and plus, of course, I do side with you on being highly suspicious that there is this realm of psyche, realm of consciousness, realm of something else-ness that is not measurable with empirical tools. Um, at the very least, I think there's probably also like a third thing, um, which again, I won't like start reaching for at this point in the conversation because I, I want to stick to to where you're going. We need um, to go there later though. Don't okay. forget about that because now I'm peaked and I'm sure people listening are as well. So I definitely want to return to that. Yeah, it may be something if you you mentioned that like one of the pods I did recently. So it may be something you you've heard about. But um but what I wanted to ask is um or what I wanted to say is that I I agree with you in terms of how I I sort of square the circle in those two things seeming like how can you have both free will and determinism? And it, it's sort of like I guess the the analogy I use is like open world RPG, right? Yeah. You you make a character the character has stats. The character has a skill tree. The, the character has a certain storyline that they have to go through, but it's t tons of open-endedness within that. Maybe there's like a moral component. Maybe there's a, you know, depending on what kind of game it is, maybe there's like a romantic component, maybe whatever. Mm -hmm. And and it seems similar. Uh, but man, then, then it's crazy because amongst all these ancient thinkers too, you start to get this anti-fatalistic streak who think that whatever your fate is, is actually trapping you. That's what's mm. trapping you in the matrix. So mm. man, it, it's just, you can, you get into such like a weird metaphysical kerfuffle with all of the <laughs> stuff that can really mess yeah. up your brain, whether you're listening to the, the Platonists or the Gnostics or the Jungians or the, you know, the uh, Hermeticists, they all have like yeah. similar, but like slightly different tweaks on all of these things. And they're so thought provoking. And I go down various rabbit holes at various times, but it's just, yeah, I, I'm I'm left okay in the gray area for the most part. But I am curious because you brought up now that, of course, your creative habit is also your professional necessity. Yeah. So it, it sounds like at a certain point, you made a point of bringing back the open-ended creative expression in light of things like Jungian archetypes and the collective unconscious and psyche and symbol and mythopoetic more lenses. Tell me what that is like and, yeah. and how you exercise that. Yeah. Uh, there's so, man, so, so many good threads. And I loved your, uh, I love the open RPG. Like I feel like, that really unlocked a thing in my head because as I've played, I've played a lot of those kind of games. I beat Elden yeah. Ring recently. Me too. Me too. Yep. Yep. It. Yep. Yeah. Um, it's great. And what uh, class and did you play? Uh, the uh, what is it called? Oh uh, man, it's been. Like I was a, I was a samurai. Months. Samurai. Yeah, I've yeah. heard it's I, a good one. I, I started a with one. a more magic heavy class, and I yeah. just I got bored running around and shooting stuff all the time. Like I want to just get yeah. in there and just. Anyway. I usually like I tend to go for the magic ones. And then this time I've gotten really into like the combat side of these games. And I thought, yeah. no, I want to go on. So I I'm I I'm one of the fighting ones that I can't remember the, what the word is. Um, uh, It's been it's been too long. It's been six months and I've been playing Zelda and all kinds of other stuff. So of course, um, yeah. but uh, but I love that. I think that's perfect. And, I, and then I just also think if you can think of like an infinite hard drive computing power, then you also have the possibility of endless alternate endings too. And that kind of, right. It's a, yeah, I, I love it. Um, but back to the, uh, the illustration practice. Yeah. So I think that, um, 
I think that what ended up happening was when I started to realize that, okay, so I have like, I have a personal story as if I go to make a picture book or if I go to make a podcast, most of my podcasts have stories in them. I do a, a lot of uh, public speaking is a big part of what I do. And that always incorporates stories and analogies and metaphors and that kind of thing that when I fell in love with public speaking and podcasting, it was because of that. And, and what happened was I, I became obsessed with analogy and kind of story as allegory of kind of like proof of a point. It's almost like, you put all these pieces together and you say, okay, let's let this play out. And if it plays out towards what I'm trying to say, the audience will have a experience of whether that's true or not. And yeah, so, you know, right. we've, we've all seen mm. the kind of propaganda where they're trying to prove a point with all these pieces, but it's not adding up. And right, we're rejecting right, right. it because we're like, the character wouldn't do that or that right. wouldn't happen or what. And so I kind of got obsessed with a uh, story as analogy or allegory um, and and kind of the, the, the power of how it reminds us of true things in a way that we feel, yeah. not in a way that we think, yeah. but it's just like, you know, how many things, we all know we should be present. But then we see those movies that really light that up. One of my favorite, it's a little bit of a guilty pleasure, but I just think it's so good in terms of story is um, About Time. If you watch About Time, mm. you I just gonna, have you, oh, I recommend it. It's a good sob fest. It'll really, like, it gets me every time. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it just illustrates, it's a, it, um, why you need to be present, why you don't yeah. want to miss things with the people you love. And, you know, we all have stories that do that for us. Um, but I got, I went, so I was, I was already an illustrator. And then I started going down this path of public speaking, storytelling and whatnot. And, you know, probably four years into that, I was listening to, I don't know if it was a Ted talk, something of that nature. And this public speaker's talking and they're like, hey, I'm just going to give you an uh, analogy to kind of tell you what I'm trying to say. Um, here's my illustration. And I was like, okay, uh, they're the same yeah. thing. Like right. that's, and I, and I think because illustration and visual art, like the design world, which I, my degree is in graphic design, but I'm not really a designer. The design world has so much theory and there's so much like good practices and, and debate around what mm. is design, what's good design, da, 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 da. Yeah. I, think, I mean, you, you eventually get into aesthetics and everything, which is like a, yeah. as ancient of a philosophical conversation as there is. Definitely. And, yeah. but illustration, I don't know if it's because it's such an introverted activity. Uh, I don't know if it's because it's such an intuitive thing but there just seem to be a lot less. There is some, but there's a lot less around what is this? What are we trying right. to do with this? And mm -hmm. I think just the lack of uh, philosophy that I could find and, yeah. and, and dig my teeth into, I just started to feel uninterested in it. And then this realizing, uh, stumbling upon, I also stumbled upon this definition of illustration, which is writing with pictures. Um, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that mixed with realizing like, oh, analogies, metaphors are illustrations and then going into symbol and archetype and, and, and dream symbol. You know, if you listen to a really good dream interpretation, yeah, you're gonna start hearing how the words they're using for the literal and the words they're using for the metaphorical are going to be the same words. And the closer you can, and then as you're like developing stories and analogies, the closer you can get, I've heard it said this way, a different way. Um, uh, a, a, one of my favorite designers, his name's Frank Camaro. He said, if you're looking for an analogy, you're trying to find different nouns that sh share the same verb. And it's just like mm. that, a robot and a human, two different nouns, 
but they can both defy their programming. So yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the defying the programming gives that tissue, but it can be, you know, just like we did with the astronaut thing, like shooting for the stars. We can, we can do that whether right. we're in a space shuttle as that noun or just as a person, like metaphorically. So I, I just started to see the richness and the opportunity and the power that illustration really is the animating force behind a story's um, ability to move you because you have to really select it well to pair with the point you're trying to make. And then, and then even beyond that, you're selecting it, you know, one of the, like, um, I just watched with my kids yesterday, the new, uh, Ninja Turtles movie. And I mm -hmm. really liked it. I thought it was I heard really it's good. Yeah. Yeah. It was really great. But I, I was thinking about how in terms of storytelling, I think it's as strong as something like Spider-Verse, wow. but it doesn't use an illustration that is uh that is an archetype that's captured the consciousness of the the culture yeah, in the yeah, same yeah. way that the multiverse has right and so right. to me underneath it the points are as good as each other they're these human powerful truths that we need to feel you know whichever they're respectively different points but they're the same kind of thing but the the illustration that they chose, one just has this psychic power, the psychic charge that the other one maybe doesn't. And and yeah. so that field of choosing archetypes, understanding symbols, finding the truths or the ideas that you want to illustrate and then finding the perfect way to illustrate that thing. Um, I'll tell you a dumb example, but again, it's just kind of an, an example. Yeah. Now when I make episode art for my podcast every week and um, one of my recent favorites was I wanted to illustrate the idea, uh, listen to yourself. And uh, I started going into the book of symbols and I'm trying mm. to find stuff around listening and hearing and that kind of thing. And I end up stumbling upon the shell and it being, you know, listening to a shell here in the ocean. And so then I created the ocean as a character listening to a shell and now it's listening to itself. Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. all those choices of playing with symbol and pairing them perfectly or as, as good as you can with the point you're trying to make to help illuminate a, cause I think also illustration is a lot like acting. It's like you're taking a text and you're trying to make people feel it yeah. um, through archetypes, you know? Right. Um, so I think, I don't know if that answers your question, I, but I, I came at it from a bunch of different angles. I don't even remember what the question was anymore, I don't, I don't but that's either. okay. <laughs> we don't, we don't need to. It's, it's open-ended riffing and it's, it's great stuff, man. Yeah. Thanks. I think the thing about archetypes that is so wild to me is when you start finding these parallels across cultures. Because one of the things that struck me when you were talking is that a good story is like an anamnesis. It's, it is like a discovery of innate knowledge that you already knew. It's yes. something that you feel in your psyche. And I, when I say psyche, I'm, I'm going for the Greek definition of both mind and soul yeah. where it's just, it's clicks. It's that subjective clicking. It's like, no one needs to explain it to you. This makes sense. It's like when a mathematical equation clicks. It's like when a geometrical proof clicks. It's but way more just subjective, I guess. You know, it's the subjective version of that. Yes, yeah. this adds up. Yes, this makes sense. No one needs to explain it to me. It's like a well formed formula of innate human and cultural and symbolic and psychological knowledge or something. And that, that in and of itself is really mind blowing when you try to take apart what that means and how, how that web of intelligence and knowledge works. It's just mind blowing. And that's one of the things that, that keeps me convinced or, or highly suspicious that this realm of psyche is, is a real thing and that we can all independently 
come to these conclusions without you know, having anyone explain things to us. And the more basic level you take this down to, the, the, the more interesting it gets. And this starts to lead back into that third thing that you said you wanted to come back to is, mm-hmm. is like, yeah, we can understand conceptually there's stuff out here. Most cognitive scientists and people studying it don't think the way we perceive the world's really how it is. But nonetheless, there's stuff, right? There's stuff we can weigh it, measure it, whatever seems to be out there. Then we can get behind this notion. We have this subjective experience of stuff is happening, psychical. Is that a separate world? Is that a connected world? Is it just connected in some way we don't understand? But then the third question is sensibility in and of itself and where the components for sense making come from number basic geometry these things um and uh you know th- this obviously goes back to platonism this goes back to, to pythagoreanism um but even contemporary thinkers who are at the tip of the spear of physics and mathematics like Roger Penrose they think about the world in this way of this like this triune world of essentially you know the stuff we can measure the mental like or not not even the stuff that we can measure but the world out there really mm-hmm. the the mental world in there and then the fact that we have number and we have this realm of a priori sense making ability where yeah. 1 plus 1 was 2 before a human mind thought it you know a triangle was a triangle before the human mind thought it um also just thought provoking things like why does every culture know what all the basic platonic solids are and basic shapes are yet those things don't exist out there in in the woods or you know wherever Mm -hmm. but we all know about it we all draw it we all we all just are like yeah it's a circle yeah it's a triangle yeah it's a square um so i I don't even know where i'm going with that but i I just felt like going there because it felt yeah it felt um it felt relevant to to what you were saying but i think when you combine those three things i guess this is my point is that it makes that that weird sense making that we have the capability to do make some level of sense. It makes that ability of, ah, yes, this story works because it's tapping into something that we're already connected to. And I think that's what myths have always done. And I think that's why human beings have been almost somehow coerced into making myths and repeating myths over and over. Mm. It's t- tell me if you feel this way, but I, I can't explain personally why I feel compelled to do some of the creative things that I do, but I just am. And it's and it's almost as if there's some kind of, you know, it's not physiological. I can't link it to like my drives for, for hunger or for reproduction or whatever, but it feels just as uh, I got to do this. You know, I got to yeah. get this out. I got to, uh, and, and what is that? You know, and, and it, it kind of explains that in a way too. Yeah, it does. And I think there's, I I had two competing, first of all, I love, I love the riff on that, that third, that third thing. And I kind of, I, I feel, I see a parallel of this idea between, you know, cultures everywhere. Yeah. Sorry, before I forget, I want to say too, that, um, so we could think of that as the platonic realm of forms or the yeah. realm of the collective unconscious and archetypes. And Jung himself did link those two ideas, which was a great, like, ooh, for me when I read that. Um, oh. So I, I wanted to get that in there too. Yeah. And, and, and are we saying, you know, um, like the, uh, I don't know why it's escaped me, just the thing that uh, he was obsessed with, with the, um, oh, mandalas and, oh, right. you yep. know, that mm-hmm. all, and, and circles and all the, you're saying like the basic things all the way up to kind of archetypal things. I, I, it kind of, I see a parallel there where I wonder if, what was the word you used at the start? I didn't know it, but it was the thing of oh, prior um, knowledge. Like, oh, and you know, anamnesis or an, anamnesis, however it's pronounced. Yeah. It's, it's just like the, uh, the, the Greek word for instead of acquiring knowledge out there empirically, like I know this because I measured it and I, you know, have reproduced it in various experiments or whatever. It's just something, you know, yeah. and there's some, there's some famous, but admittedly, like you can poke holes or argue against, but there's some famous examples of this from some, uh, platonic dialogues of like, there's a, 
There's one where Socrates is getting a boy to solve a geometric, a basic geometric proof without, you know, he he's not feeding him the answer. He's he's giving him the setups and the kid's figuring it out himself. And they're using that as an example of like, even this kid knows this stuff and he's not right. educated yet. Yeah. And that I did, it was Pl Plato was into that, right? Like oh, this yeah. idea that we're, we're just like remembering and all the knowledge is already within us, that kind of idea. I, right. I think that's really, uh, it's a cool idea. And like you said, I think it's, there's a lot of ways you can kind of just dismantle that or, or think of it just a different way. But, um, but I, as you were saying that about with story, I almost feel like stories, it's almost like where I think we're trying to like tell better and better stories that mm -hmm. get closer and closer to true. And where we have some, we have something that recognizes where we're trying to go or something like that. Like even as I was watching uh, Ninja Turtles yesterday, which I, I love kids movies that are good mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. often, uh, you know, in order to be good, they have to be at the core, a good story. Right. And, um, and it's classic storytelling too. And, um, you know, I, even though I really liked it, I felt there was something where I was like, you know, I think the stories that are going to prove out like the thing about this, that feels unable to go past the, the, this Ninja Turtle creation from the eighties is that it's based on violence. And I mm. look, I like, uh, like I said, I love Elden Ring. I love playing, you know, I love the, the combat. I can get into it just like anybody else, but I could feel that one part of me being like, yeah, this story is going to have to evolve because I think we're, we're trying to figure out a way forward without violence. I think yeah. consciousness wants to, you know, wants to do, go that way. Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of, uh, what it was, um, get, kind of churning up for me, but, yeah. um, what were you, I can't remember where, what the actual question was, but I was, or what, what was the last thing you said? Oh, um, I guess I'll, I'll just, I'll just spin it into a, a new question. Yeah. And so do you, I, I kind of was asking this before and I think we, I think we went a slightly, to, oh, this was my question a while back when I was like, I don't remember mm. what the question was anyway. Yeah. Was, was the, the professional creativity versus the personal oh, creative yeah. sort of catharsis and the how you actually delineate between those two things and is is there like a personal almost meditative or maybe to put it into jungian depth psychology analytical psychology terms uh almost like an act of imagination type thing yeah. that you that you do where because you know like in the in the red book for instance a lot of this stuff, a lot of the art in the Red Book was Jung going through various endogenous thought experiments, basically, where he would kind of get himself into a almost like a trance state mm -hmm. until he felt like he wasn't driving anymore and characters were emerging yeah. and he would converse with the characters. And it, it was almost like a, it was pretty much like dreams that he was having well conscious enough to capture them, write them down, recreate them in, in art and images and stuff like that. Um, yeah. ha has your, has your practice gotten as deep as going in that direction? I mean, you? I, I uh, you know, that's the kind of, uh, statement that I feel, um, an audience or somebody after you has to dis determine. Mm, I don't know okay. if it's, it is felt that way at times. And I have some very, I kind of probably the most core property idea, you know, thing in my creative practice is this thing called invisible things, which mm -hmm. I made a picture book uh, with yeah. my wife and we published it over the summer. And, um, that really was birthed from practicing active imagination with, when I didn't really fully understand what that was. Mm. And I'll, I'll tell you how I kind of stumbled into that in just a second. But, um, but before I go there, I think it's really, 
it's a great question to wrestle with as a creator the and i love the way you framed it of the the personal and the professional you know i grew up as a a dude from the midwest and not, i didn't grow up in culture i grew up in a very like traditional place and i was raised by you know my mom is an artist and um mm. and a kind of um trying to find a, a <laughs> trying to find a an, an acceptable free, term to free say. spirit maybe yeah 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 <laughs> trying to trying to be gentle with it right. um and you know she was an addict and she uh she was just is kind of a mess in a whole bunch of ways but i wasn't i didn't grow up with around her and mm -hmm. i grew up with my dad and my stepmom and they both are you know corporate america fully bought into the whole thing and so i d i think initially as I got started choosing a career, going into to design and illustration, I didn't really, and to my, this kind of worked for me for a while, but I didn't see a difference between mm -hmm. the, the personal and the professional. I didn't see, like, I was just raised on pop culture. So the art that I had, it was all commercial. So I didn't really make that distinction. And I think for the first leg of my journey, that served me because I didn't, the ways I might've been compromising, I didn't know I was or, yeah, yeah. I, you know, whatever. It took me a long time to kind of uh, get to a place where I do see those two things as distinctly different. I And I see them as kind of as different as the deep self and the ego. Right. But the whole point being that they work together that, you know, and that goes back to that thing of the deep self, the personal stuff, the, the, the stuff that is trying, feels like it's an impulse to put into the universe. Uh, that I think of that part of me as blind to reality, doesn't mm -hmm. really think about money, doesn't really know what the opportunities are. It's more just a, it's like a impulse from a, a, you know, deep space. And I'm supposed, the ego side of me is just supposed to figure out how do I, how do I find the resources and make the, mm -hmm. and apply this to the opportunity? Because, you know, when I was 13, my mom bought me a, uh, a, a microphone. Cause she's like, you should be, she's, she's like, I think you should be in radio. And of course, like, that's how I think about the deep self is deep self is like, I think you need to be talking on radio mm -hmm. and you're like the radio it's called podcasting now mom like you know it's that kind of like you have to interpret it mm -hmm. and so um i think that uh so so now i see it more as like a tension of opposites thing of and also a thing of you can't do both at the same time it's kind of, i think that creative personal side in that business minded or career minded or practical minded side. I think it's very much like that. You can't write and edit. You can't be in both mm -hmm. brain waves at the same time and you have to pulse back and forth. And so, um, when I first started in my practice, I really just did not I went to college and I didn't, it was a really open experience, not a lot of guidance where I went, which was cool. Like, you know, there was a lot of good yeah. things about that, but ultimately I was like, look in a couple of years, I'm going to have to do this as a career. So I was just like panicking and I just really just started making work that was trendy. And I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that's a phase for a lot of mm -hmm. people. And also it's a phase for most creators. You've got to go through the imitation phase where you're just kind of, you know, learning from your heroes and, and that kind of thing. But once I got out of college and that those trends that I was a part of kind of dried up, I had to, I was back at square one in a way and I didn't have any substance built below that. And I think it wasn't until that time that I realized like, I'm going to have to do work that has no commercial viability. I'm going to have to separate these phases and yeah. I'm going to have to go into a phase where I don't know what the point or use or commercial value is of the stuff that I'm exploring and making. Um, and so I went into this process where I made a new character every weekday for a year. And this is kind of going back to 
how it was active imagination before I ever knew anything about Jungian thought or that idea yeah, or yeah, yeah. whatever. And it came from um, an artist who I was a huge fan of that essentially was taking a, you can take an, um, a, a psychoanalytic approach to reading a story where you're saying like all these characters are just part of the same psyche, but you can also take a psychoanalytic approach to creating. Mm -hmm. And that's what I stumbled into. I, I when I, in that time, I was just desperately like consuming every interview I could from all my favorite creators and just studying the work. And one of my favorites is, um, uh, Charles Schultz who made peanuts mm -hmm. and Charles, Charlie Brown. Yeah. And he said something that just really lit me on fire. He said that you know, his name is Charles. He's Charlie. So all the time people will ask him, like, are you Charlie Brown? Like, is this just autobiographical? Which is funny too, because Charlie Brown's such a loser and he's depressed <laughs> right. and all that. And I loved him. I mean, I really related to him. So I'm not, I'm not dissing him, but, um, Charles Schultz would say, yes, but all of them are me. So right. Snoopy is the part that I wish I was. Lucy is my sarcastic kind of cunning side. Right, right. Lionel's my spiritual side and so on. And I was so fascinated. I didn't know that how that connected yeah. to Jungian thought or anything, but I was right. like, I think I'm going to do that. And so right. I did this project where I did a new character every weekday uh, for a year and every, most of them, some of them were inspired by other people I, I know but most of them were just trying to take one aspect of myself and get it out of my head and get it onto a page in the form of mm -hmm. a character. And then those characters, they're really exploring the kind of hidden world archetype. Like the, I think about it like, um, uh, like my favorite version is, uh, I mean, there's Alice in Wonderland and Wizard of Oz and all that. Okay. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, like, um, my favorite is uh, Link to the Past, Zelda, mm -hmm. the Super Nintendo one. And uh, just like, they, I didn't know at the time, but I was like tr wrestling with hidden realms. And all oh, the characters yeah. were kind of hiding. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, then it mm -hmm. eventually evolved into this thing called Invisible Things. But that Man. all came from that. Yeah, that's such a rich archetype right there. The, the, hidden, the hidden realm that's just there beyond our perception. I have real early memories of of imagining hidden doorways in my house and like thinking like, oh, I don't know, man, just the, the weird <laughs> some of that weird stuff that you just think about when you're a kid or you dream about when you're a kid and you don't understand that there's just this rich, endless tradition of that exact same idea. Um, yes. And there's some just great quotes too, like Heraclitus has a like from a Heraclitus's fragments the pre-Socratic philosopher, he mm -hmm. calls, um, I, I don't remember if he's saying it about nature or the mystery, but he means like the, the, the numinous realm, right? The, the noetic realm, he calls it a self hiding mystery. Mm. And I love this mm. idea of it being of, of like the deeper layers of reality. They just, they hide themselves for some reason, mm. but you can find ways to either inductively sniff them out or you can discover them somehow and i definitely think tapping into what we would call the quote unquote imagination is one of the ways those hidden things start to show themselves and it's so hard and i'm kind of having a micro epiphany right now that it's so hard to if you say this is a self-hiding thing well what does that imply it implies i don't know what it looks like right so that then, so then you start freestyling with the imagination of like, I like what what are these like? I sense that it feels like this. It feels like this. Maybe more like this. And you're just, again, you're you're riffing with your subconscious, with the collective unconscious, with whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And something comes out, and something comes out that can, if you're a good artist, faithfully capture an element of that hidden thing. And it's remarkable yeah. because because for the same reasons that that innate knowledge works, that anamnesis works, other people point at it like, yeah, that, 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 that. I get it. I get it. I get it. You're speaking to something. You're speaking to something that I get. And what is that? I get, you know, quote unquote, I get. 
I, again, I, it's oh that, my gosh. Yeah. Go, I loved that. What, what were we going to say? No, I mean, it just, it's just yet another example of something that we're not, we're not saying anything to say, I get it, yeah. but you understand what it means. That I person the, understands something. Yeah. I, and I feel like the artist creative impulse is that it's almost like a Koan kind of thing. Yeah. Of you're tr the impulse is wanting to codify the, I get it, wanting to explain it, wanting to be like, this is what it is, but you can never get there. Like right. uh, if you're a consumer of creative stuff and I think it like to some degree, and there's a huge spectrum and it could mean a lot of things um, that we're all creative people. That's humanity. That's one of the things about being a human. But I do think uh, I've heard, um, what, what's her name? Oh, Beth Pickens, who is um, a creative therapist, basically. Uh, she says that the difference between an artist uh, and a regular person, because we're all creative, is that the artist has to do it. Like yeah. on a mental level, this you, they can't, they're going to get sick if they don't do it. And I think that's almost that impulse of you have, you're consuming, you're like, oh, I get it. Yes, I can, I can vibe with that. And then a creator is like, I get it. And, and I want to critique it. And I'm like, it's yeah. not, I get it, but it's all like, I, let's try again um, to get even closer to it. Mm -hmm. But I love mm -hmm. that self-hiding quote. I'm going to yeah. dive deep into that after this, because one, one of the symbol things that a lot of the characters have in common, there's a lot of threads that go through them, but one of them is that a lot of the characters are hiding. So they're either hiding in a, in a cardboard box or under an umbrella and you can mm -hmm. just see like the eyes or a cloud mm -hmm, or mm -hmm, whatever, yeah. like half of them is hiding and it's, and it is, it's trying to use symbolism to get at like, these are all things in the invisible world. And um, they're all things that are self hiding and man, I, yeah, that, that really strikes me. I'm going to be chewing on it yeah. for, for a long time. Yeah. Do you, have you formed an opinion on the, like ontologically what you associate that other world with, or, I mean, it sounds like you're, you're very open to the idea of that. It really is this realm. It's not just a function of the brain or something that we've made up, but it's it's got some kind of a priori existence of a human brain. Is is that where you land or do you just not care about landing? And that's just what I, the idea you know, you like? I think like, honestly, I, I don't, I, I think the best way to describe it would be, I don't, I don't care to land, right? but I yeah. do really care to explore. And I, right. so I don't have, I think growing up in the Midwest where everybody has <laughs> very staunch religious opinions yeah. about, I, I, at some point in my early twenties, I think I just felt like essentially the way everyone's practicing spirituality is as if the purpose of being here is a fact finding mission. Like those self hiding things. The purpose is to nail them down, get them right. And when you right. die, you're going to be given a scantron. And if you get the right answers, you yeah, get yeah, to yeah. go into the good place. Right, right, right. And I think that I think when I would try to pray or meditate or connect with whatever the, the goodness of the universe is, I just never felt that that thing was, would ever give me a scantron like no, that. It was agreed. just never like, if I was like, it just didn't seem like what we're doing here, you know, but I don't, but I love, I, you know, even like when Mormons would come around, you know, knock on your door. I think I always just had a thing of like, come in. I want to hear this. I love hearing, mm -hmm. wow. love hearing all of the <laughs> ideas about mm -hmm. Mormonism mm -hmm. and the lore and all of it. I'm not going to adopt it, but I I'm into it. I, and I'm even, I will even find like interesting truth in that, but I also sure. find it interesting. Like I, I didn't, I want to dive deeper into, I just heard about, um, the kind, I think it was Celtic, mm. their version of, that space. And I yeah. can't remember what it's called, but like the, dru um, the druidic 
kind of thing. Maybe it's a, but it's the imagination. It's imaginary space that really exists okay. where all these things kind of live and, right. uh, and have, um, yeah, like have yeah, I'm, desires and, and, and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. I'm very much in this place where I'm looking for a way that feels authentic for me to try to start directly playing more in that place. And there's lo- there's different ways to do it. And all of them feel aesthetically kind of foreign to me in a way where I'm like, I'm not ready to go drawing magic circles and like doing rituals and, you know, trying to, you know, do these various things, these like graduated things. But I find it very interesting. Like I find I find the proposition of that interesting. But in practice, like the idea of like walking around sir, saying these words, you know, drawing pentag- <laughs> drawing pentagrams and going, ha, yeah. and stuff like that is just not <laughs> it, it doesn't feel like my thing. And maybe it's just one of those yeah. humps you have to get over. I don't know. But it's <laughs> but I do feel the need to to play in that space. And I think like I think doing quote unquote mundane things can be a way to do that if they're somewhat wrapped in ritual. I think you have mm-hmm. to have yeah. some kind of ritualistic demarcation of I am going into the other place now. And I think active imagination is probably the closest thing that feels okay and stripped down of culture and and weirdness enough um, to feel like I, I want to start doing that more often. Like I've done some active imagination meditations and stuff, and it's interesting, but I've never yeah. gotten to the point where I really feel like I'm not driving. And this thing is t- without the advent of significant, uh, pharmacological perturbment <laughs> of my, of yeah. my, uh, of my consciousness. So, which I think is another very valuable, powerful path, but yeah, I do feel like I need a way to, to start entering that space more reliably more often uh and that might be the way that i go is with is with active imagination but does your creative practice feel like you're consistently getting to a place like that or or is it one of the things because i find this a lot too where i look back on things and i see things that i didn't even consciously like oh man this is totally this and i like I, i made a shirt a long time ago for uh for like a third eye drop shirt. And, um, it was before I got really into some of these conversations we've been having about like fate and understanding the sort of mythological roots of what, what fate is and the myth of Ur from Plato's Republic and all of these things that like describe exactly how, a per like a soul or a person gets a fate and all these things. And then I went back and looked at that shirt and I was like, holy shit, there's a lot of layers of this thing that I wasn't even thinking about that fit perfectly with that. Um, so that, that's one element that's sort of like, I don't know what I'm doing in the moment. And then I look back and see deeper layers, but then there's also the hands off the muse is driving and I'm just kind of like a puppet for the muse. Um, can, can you reliably hit that or is it, I mean, again, like uh, it's one of those things where maybe in retrospect, I'll be able to, I, I feel, I feel like I'm, that's what yeah. I'm trying to do. Um, I think that I, I think there's a few different things that have become ritual for me that maybe it's a different way than we see in organized religion most of the time. Yeah. I make a podcast every week and mm-hmm. I make a a lot I would say about 2 thirds are just me solo and I make an illustration every week for every episode and that process is and it's really the mechanics of a story the at least the way I think about story. And so the way that that manifests as a practice inactive imagination or, or, or kind of essentially like daydreaming and interpreting it is Mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. every story for me starts with some surprising truth. I would say that's probably the best way I could say it. I think like the best, I think classic stories, that's kind of what they do. They're, they're really, they're a three part proof. Um, that acts in a very 
particular mathematical kind of way, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and there's lots of really good, you know, deconstructions of that that I'm a fan of too. But I think that there's always a, in the same way for me, one practice I do a lot. So every day I take like an hour long bath every mm. morning. I do that. And I, nice. that's almost, it's like a, my, that's my real religion over st story is bath time. And oh, man. Uh, <laughs> I want to, I want to throw this in here real quick because there's yeah. some really interesting stuff that I've just started finding out about that has to do with oracles and ancient forms of entering altered states where you have to mm. submerge the body in sacred mm. waters. Mm. And like somehow like the, the notion of your, you're becoming almost more of an antenna by submerging mm -hmm. yourself in water for whatever that is. Um, that's actually a really well established thing. And there's, there's places, you know, if you get into the lore, there's places where supposedly, you know, ma mancy people with mancy, like there's different, you know, like geomancy, like di different divination right, abilities. Yeah. They would find a water source and be like, this is sacred water. You need to build a temple here. And apparently like the temple of a uh, Delphi and Apollo, and there's a bunch of Egyptian ones I've heard of too. I just wanted to get that out there. Cause there might yeah. be some interesting parallels with that. And even, uh, you know, Lords in the Catholic tradition there's a lot of places and and these other traditions too where they have these relationships to water mm -hmm. um but i yeah i mean i think even at the like i i totally track with that and then i also track with the the physical of just sensory deprivation just mm -hmm, like that mm -hmm. that's just the thing and also just like water i've also heard i heard like andrew garfield talking about uh i think it was on mark Marin's show like stepping into the ocean and just feeling like they had a message. And I was like, that's mm. happened to me, that exact thing. And I thought, so I, look, I could get really weird with it or I could Let's just go. be totally physical. Like, it's just right. like, yeah, yeah, all your stuff, you know, what I, I don't care, but that's what I do every day. Mm -hmm. And I, and I'm always, it usually starts with, um, I've just started integrating a gratitude practice into it. That's been a Beautiful. lifesaver because yeah. I am, that's my biggest problem is, is my ability to complain and see what's missing. It's a, it's a creative impulse of like, I want to bring something new, but I need to like, be like, what's here, what's good. Um, but it usually starts with me reviewing my dream and just seeing if there's anything, the way I think about dreams. Yes. Again, like I said, I can get really weird with it. And I, and sometimes they do feel like, messages from another realm. But at the very least, I know that it gives me a real grounded perspective beyond my persona of what am I worried about? What am I wrestling with? What do I, what's really happening emotion mm -hmm. on an emotional level? And so, um, I use some of those Jungian tools to try to like get that out. And then if I come across an idea that is, that has that libido, that enthusiasm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that it's like really, um, yeah, ch psychically charged. Yeah. That's what becomes a podcast episode. Mm. And then also becomes the illustration, which again is me reaching for symbol, reaching for, um, yeah, an archetype or, or, or language. And so I do think that that has become a very real ritual practice of that for me. Yes. Yes. Um, and I've been doing the podcast for almost 10 years, like nine years or something. Wow. So it's, yeah, it's for a second. I thought you were going to say, I've been doing the podcast from the bath. And I was like, Oh, that sounds like a, that actually sounds <laughs> like sounds... something someone would do. Um, <laughs> it's, except for you might kill yourself on accident. Yeah. Um, yeah. You got to get the technology, right? Um, yeah. Some waterproof mics or something. Uh, yeah, no, that, 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 registers a lot. And I think there's, that really speaks to something I've experienced and I'm sure everybody out there can relate to, which is you can't force creativity. You yeah. can't like, it's it, again, it's one of these paradoxical relationships because I very much love the war of art mentality of sure. the music. Yeah, the me mu too. The, the muse loves, and, yeah, the, the yeah. muse loves a blue collar worker. She loves sure, it when you yeah. get your ass, yeah, yeah, ass yeah. in the seat and you work. But there's also something to 
what you hear artists say time and time again, which is that you you can't force it and you have to let it come to you. And I think to let it, quote unquote, come to you, you have to be in a sort of hands off mental state where you're where you're just sort of slowing down, meditative, relaxed, and then that's when just something pops in. And again, so many parallels to this in the ancient world with practices like incubation, with, like I said, the thing about oracles supposedly submerging in water and stuff like that. This is really well-established stuff. And I think now we probably could use more pinpoint language in terms of brain states and whatever. But I still think that's only like one dimensional slice sure. of, of, of yeah, what, yeah. what's really probably going on in terms of the psyche and the the invisible and all these other things. Um, on that note, man, I, I just want to throw this into the conversation because I thought it was so interesting and so many people are obviously a fan of him. Is um I saw this riff recently from Andrew Huberman, the you know, the super famous yeah, yeah. neuroscientist where he admitted that he has started praying. And I was like, Whoa, Ooh, this is really interesting. interesting. Yeah. And it's, it's for all the reasons we're talking about. It's that I've acquired all of this knowledge. I still feel like I need help. I still feel like I need inspiration. I still feel like I don't know shit. And I need to just kind of prostrate myself before the mystery and be like, help me you know, help me get, inspire me. Like, you know, and yeah. I, that, that hit me hard. And also I think of, like, there's a lot of bravery involved in that too, because he's part of that hardcore academic mainstream that are immediately going to be like, are you kidding me? Come on, man. Like, yeah. You, you pray, you yeah. know, materialist um, ma materialism. Kind yeah, of thing. yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I was really, I really loved, That's great. loved hearing that. And, and he looked vulnerable talking about it like he looked a yeah. little choked up at times and like i can't believe i'm saying this but i pray every day you know i i, I pray for a good what maybe like a half hour hour every day type of thing where Whoa. i just kind of open myself up and just ask for help and um reflect and me meditate and stuff like that i love that That's, and i actually yeah. think more creative people could use to to, to do that because it's something that just occurred to me that I don't know the science behind it, but it, what it triggered in my head was I've thought a lot about the, some people call it the open versus the closed mode and the yeah. closed mode being your editing brain, mm -hmm. you're, you yeah. know, and the open mode praying is a very open mode because yes. you're, you're literally opening yourself up. You're saying, I can't do this on my own. You're really, you're asking for the inspiration. Like, I think that as a ritual in its own right, prior to creative yeah. acts, like that, that makes tons of sense. The other thing I wanted to just say was, um, yeah, I, I just thought, I imagine that you doing this show has a lot of parallels to what I was describing in the uh, active imagination cycle of diving into the unconscious, seeing what thing kind of bubbles up as like, this is the thing I want to explore next. And then having the ritual of creating an episode about it is, it has become kind of a spiritual practice for me. And then I thought that has to be similar to you in terms of who you, oh, yeah. who you interview, what, you know, what little diversions you go into. It's probably, I, that's why I think a creative habit yeah. has so much to give and so much in common yep. with, you know, spiritual ritual, you know? Definitely. Yeah. And there, there's a progression to it. You know, it's even, even if you only do the exercise, like you said, of I'm doing a character every day or week or whatever yeah. it was. And it's yeah. the same thing. I'm doing a podcast. I'm putting something out every day, every week. There's this psychical progression you're committing to. There's this you know, like you, to your point, the cycle of idea cycling and oh, I don't like this and oh, whatever, I'm going to try it again and not, okay, it's got to be good enough. It's got to be good enough now. And you, you have to just going through that, I think is an immensely important process for understanding your mind, sculpting your mind. It's some kind of like weird fit, like psychical fitness that I don't think yeah. it's talked about. Um, you know, think about the, the sort of people who are 
the perpetually pregnant creative people who are like, always have an idea, never do anything, always have an idea, never do anything. You got to get over that. I mean, you got to get over that. And yeah. I get it because I, so I used to play in bands too. And I wanted to write epic songs. I wanted to write stuff that was pulling from all this stuff. I wanted to write like the equivalent to like Homer's Odyssey or something yeah. in musical form <laughs> and just like hidden yeah. layers of esoteric meaning and stuff. But yeah, you got to get through those progressions of like finishing stuff. It's done now. It's done now. And there's, that's where things can really start to flow and open up. Cause I don't, I'm not going to presume to speak for the muse, but I know she don't like a guy who walks around pregnant with an idea for five years. Very She's true. like, no, thanks. I'll move on well, to someone who's actually going to hit the publish button or, or, or whatever. Um, so yeah, no, I'm, I'm definitely with you. It's, it's definitely a, a thing. Yeah. And there's all these weird stages. I'm, I'm in a place where, you know, although we, we have some key differences cause I don't have kids. Sure. So, you know, I'm sure your day has to be a lot more structured than mine. Yeah, true. So, yeah, so my, true. I have like, I have a lot of mental wandering, I feel like I do, where I'm just sort of in the, you know, it's funny because you're talking about being open versus closed. And the immediate phrase that came to my mind is, man, my spiritual orifice is open a lot of the time. <laughs> it's just like, just, something come to me, you know, just please, like yeah. whatever that, that signal of just like longing of just like stewing in my longing. I do that yeah. a lot. And it's kind yeah. of embarrassing because it's not, I think if that's directed, it's great. But I think if it's just like self stewing, it gets very uh, sort of just tragic and gross or something. But at least I'm doing it in the privacy of my own home or behind a <laughs> microphone in front of thousands of people, whichever. Yeah. But um, <laughs> but yeah, man, I, I I'm with you. It's it's definitely a progression and definitely a, I consider it to be sacred. And I don't think it matters whether you know everybody out there thinks it is or rolls their eyes at that idea or whatever. Mm -hmm. I definitely think there's absolutely something valuable about doing it, yeah. and. It, it's another one of those things that's like an archetype. It's it's the birth of the idea, the the imperfect rendering of the pure idea, and then the even more imperfect final uh, draft that you're like, I guess it's done, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, it's 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 another example of that fractal, of that that infinite fractal coming from nowhere from the self hidden yeah. place, I think. And that, that, that process, it makes sense where as you progress in your craft, the impulse that's maybe coming from a perfect place and your ability to really create what you had in your head, like that gets closer and closer and you get more of an overlap. But if you don't act on it, mm -hmm. you don't, get any closer. And one of the things about that's, what's so interesting. I think about the idea of a story as a kind of proof of some kind yeah, yeah, yeah. is that until you put all the characters down on the page and you work it out, you don't really have a full sense of did this prove it? You know, when I was in one of my early books trying to put it together, the end of the story ended up being something that at the time I would have disagreed with, but it couldn't mm. end any other way. Mm. And so I was like, okay, well, I guess I have to change my beliefs now because this, the, I put all the pieces down and it, almost more as a question and yeah. the answer that came through challenged how I saw the world. And so that was the act of, I think, putting it into onto the canvas and making it so I could see it. That's where active imagination, I think, makes sense of not just keeping it in your head or at least speaking it, if not drawing it or writing it. I think that's the thing of morning pages even of like, you have all these things stewing and in your head and it's just, and it's just like you said, this, you have this, I get in that same state and you're right. Kids, I think commitments uh, are a good counterbalance to yeah, that totally. open mode because yep. they force you into action. Mm -hmm. And that's what a habit is too. Like the habit of doing an episode forces me to be like, get out of the bath, yep. quit, 
trying to, and I also think about it like I've said it like this, like I feel like uh, God or the universe or whatever this thing is that's, you know, giving you this stuff. Often in my seeking, because I'm such a seeker, just like you were describing, same. Yeah. exactly the same. You know, every day I'm like, all right, what's the new, th- like, come on. Like, and I feel like often the answer I get is you can't have seconds if you don't finish your plate. Like, Ooh, yeah, j- just f- finish this. I, t- I told you something three years ago. You're still working on it. Do yeah. that. Do that thing. Get to the end of it. Learn what you got to learn. And then it, the next thing will happen, you know? Yeah. yeah. That might be a great closing qu- thought, man. I, yeah. I love that. I love that. And this has Thanks. been so much fun. We could, we could definitely, we could definitely revisit this many times, I think. And you're definitely welcome to come back. Thank Um, you. What, um, before we do though, what do you, where do you want to point people? What do you have burning in your, burning in your pocket at the moment? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, thanks. I love this. It was very cathartic to talk to somebody with such a, a similar open seeking, um, yeah. state. So it was very, and I very didn't even enjoyable. say, I didn't even say this too, but I, I grew up in the Midwest too. So we have, Oh, all, you did? That in Where are you yeah. from? Um, Appleton, Wisconsin. Okay. So I'm from uh, near Indiana. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah. So I have a new kid's book called invisible things. That's a product of a bunch of stuff we were talking about. It, it is a kid's book, but, um, uh, the, it kind of accidentally, a lot of the reviews talk about it being, uh, kind of a guided meditation. And it is that, and there actually are things injected into that. Um, but it, the, on part like exercises that we did on purpose, but I didn't think of it like that. Cause I'm ADHD. Mm. I have all this yeah. energy. Meditation is a challenge for me. Um, but it's that book is me taking all the hidden worlds of Alice in Wonderland, wizard of Oz and all that. And it's kind of a, it's a tribute to when I was 17 and I realized like those hidden worlds are real in terms of quantum physics and just, and just the sensory other things you can't see, like uh, national geographic says 97% of the universe is invisible. So oh, wow. it's about that. It's about how magic our world is. So that's it. And I also have a podcast called creative pep talk, which um, I do every week. Beautiful, man. Yeah. Well, let's do this again for sure. Lots of fun. Definitely and I, and I agree, man, it's, it's cathartic to talk to you too, because even though I, I have these kinds of conversations more, it's yeah. still like people that I really feel like are at a similar point on the, on the time space, mag- mysterium, tremendum, whatever the fuck's going on <laughs> is, is, is still very rare. And I, and I feel like you're one of those, man. So this is it's rare that you're in the same neighborhood. It's right. like, you're like, wait, we're yeah. And we have some different maps and stuff. It's, right. it's great. Yeah, man. All right. Thanks for doing it. Thank you.